TV presents Monica Pearson, one-on-one. He's Atlanta's homegrown radio personality. Ryan Cameron is the voice of Atlanta. He trademarked the title given to him by Atlanta Magazine. He's won two local Emmy Awards, been nominated for two National Association of Broadcasters Marconi Radio Awards, and he's in the Georgia Radio Hall of Fame. <laughs> Better me for you to ask priests. Ryan Cameron is now into hats, and that's why he wanted me to meet him at Fruition on Murphy Avenue near Atlanta's West End. So why wearing hats now? Why are you into hats now? Because I got to, you know, when you go from the, I mean, after a certain age, you, you get past the baseball cap era. Um, then you got to try to figure out something. As my therapist said, Ryan, you must realize that you are now a middle-aged man. So how has your therapy changed you? My therapy has, I, I feel like I'm a different man now. How? Because, you know, they talk about childhood trauma and what happens to you when you're younger. Like when I was, you know, very young, I had my eye accident where I was just, I was from an abusive relationship. I was afraid to come out of my room because my mother was in a relationship with a guy who hated the fact that she had a son. And so when I came back to live with my mother, he despised me. So every chance he could get, he did something to me, bullied me, pushed me around. So I had the chicken pox and I was afraid to come out of the room to watch TV. Cause I, you know, I remember the worst thing that would happen to me, Monica is, my mother would let him drive her car, which means that he would come back home and I would just be cringing, waiting to see what was gonna happen. And so I was in the uh, in my room because we didn't have a television in the room and I was playing with a ruler and shooting down toy soldiers, you know, with a rubber band. And I came back and I, just like I'm sitting on the stool, I sat on the ruler and it cracked. So when I pulled it back to shoot it down, the ruler came back and it hit me in the eye. So then, you know, you, you get something in your eyes that you shake, but it was black and yellow. So I knew, I knew something was wrong, but he was in the shower. So I said, here, yeah, I gotta go and I gotta get this man who despises me and tell him something's wrong. And so I go from that, I get him, he calls my mother and I'm in surgery like an hour later and developed like two cataracts. And this is, I mean, this is way back in the day. So, you know, they say sometimes with trauma, you're kind of parked at that age. Mm -hmm. So I'm like 11, you know, 10. So it was kind of like I had an arrested development and I felt like my development had uh, been arrested and it took me a long time to, to go back in and realize how that affected me, how it affected my relationships. And going back and, and talking about that kind of helped me start to where I am today. But you know, even as a kid, kid, even younger, you had a um, speech impediment. Yeah. And now you're in a business. <laughs> I, I know it, it's, it, it's funny because when I was uh, at Collier Heights Elementary School, they had a group of us and we all had speech impediments. So it was Wyan or Wawa or something like that. So they took like eight of us um, to Clark Atlanta University and they did what is basically hooked on phonics. And so for six weeks, they did all these, you know, cards and letters or whatever. But at the end of it, they played the before and after on CAU, uh, WCLK radio. So this is what the kids sounded like then, and this is what they sound like now. And, and now, and the first time I heard myself in my grandfather's living room with those headphones on, I heard myself on the radio, I was like, that's it. That's what I'm not, so I mean, to go from a speech impediment to a Hall of Fame career is, um, it's just God. Man. Ryan was raised mostly by his grandmother in Southwest Atlanta, Bankhead, until his mom moved him to Smyrna. I had never seen a white person except on TV. Really? <laughs> Cause I'm living on Bankhead. The only time we saw white people was when they came down the street to try to sell us insurance. You know, there's always a white man that would come down and be like, oh, where your mom at? It's the white man. She not here. <laughs> Tell him I'm not here. Tell him I'm not here. <laughs> she said she's not here. And that was the only time we would see him. So to go from that to inside East Cobb Middle School was culture shock. I understand that one student was wearing a shirt that was really negative about people of color. Yeah. And you went to the teacher right. to point it out. Yeah. She, um, I, in the lunch line and, um, 
the shirt said, uh, if God wanted N-words to ride Harley Davidson's, he wouldn't have made Hondas. And he was talking about motorcycles. And I was like, oh my God. And I went and told, and then the teacher was like, it's just a t-shirt. And I was like, okay, this is gonna be an issue. Now, is that when you started using humor to get you out of situations that were well, see, uncomfortable? A lot of people don't understand this. And I gotta say, I, I wanna make sure that people understand, like two white teachers, Ms. Gunderson and Ms. Smith, they were the ones who encouraged me to be innovative and, and outgoing. And they would let me cut up at the end of the week if I behaved during the week. So they were like, okay, just calm it down. We don't know, you know, we didn't know it was ADHD then. then calm it down, Mr. Hyperactive. If you can wait till Friday, when we're doing current events, we'll let you do your thing. And that's kind of how it got started. So I always give them credit for, you know, and, and coming from a class where there was only 14 black people in my, in my senior class. Uh, out of 300 people. Well, you were the first black president at your school, Campbell right. High School. Mm -hmm. But then you were reminded of your blackness when your Honda was destroyed. Oh my God. I, you know, my, 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 my uncle got me a, a, a Honda MB5 and I used to ride it to school with my ROTC uniform on. And I was so happy, man. I was like, man, I don't never have to catch the bus again because I was always late. And my mother would call and she'd like, you know, she, your mother calls and the phone rings and she calls again and she said, you better not miss that bus. And once I got that motorcycle, I was like, oh, you know what? I can just ride to school and park it. So I go outside one day and I'm looking for it and it's gone. And we go, there's a ravine where we live off a cliff. There's probably more construction there. They might have built some more apartments or something, but there's a ravine and it's at the, it's at the bottom. Like somebody's thrown it off. Uh, deliberately and and cut up the seats and it was right after I had won the election and the message was don't think you all that <laughs> don't think you all that Ryan and he says he got that same feeling again when he was dropped after 20 years the last 17 as the announcer of the Hawks basketball team this is the first time I've ever talked about this because I just felt like it was 20 years of rooting for the team and, 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 and making them understand how much we love them. In 2001, Ryan joined the Hawks to do contests with fans between plays. Then in 2004, he became the first black person to be the on-court announcer. Back then, the Hawks were losing games and attendance. Ryan was their biggest fan and cheerleader. So good at hyping up the crowd, he became part of a video game. But after 20 years, Ryan lost his job. It was a business decision, according to the team. Ryan no longer works for the company Odyssey that broadcasts the Hawks games. But Ryan says it was personal and started when he was advised to ask for payment for recording robocalls for the multi-billion dollar redevelopment of the Gulch in downtown Atlanta. I went to the person and I said, hey, this is what I want. And about 10 minutes later, my phone rang and it was an executive and he read me up and down six ways to Sunday. How dare you? I can't believe that you're asking for money. When we come back, how Ryan is coping with rejection, not only from his loss with the Hawks, but in his love life too. So we went from the greatest relationship for almost a year to broken up after I proposed. Over a ring? Metro 75, The Real Sound of Atlanta, Ryan Cameron, Uncensored, Neo. Ryan Cameron keeps busy as the afternoon jock on Magic 107.5, but he's still processing his firing by the Hawks. He has tickets, but has not been to one game. You know what my, my therapist said? And it's always when you have somebody that kind of reins you back in. She said, Ryan, for 42 nights a year, you let that affect anniversaries, birthdays, vacations, anything you wanted to do had to be dependent on when that schedule came out. You better not have nothing going on on New Year's Eve if they got a game on December 31st. You better not have nothing on Christmas Eve. She said, 
You would have kept walking in that building after 20 years, for 30 years, for 40 years. You would have never left. Now, was she wrong? No, she wasn't. So I got 42 nights back and I got my life back, but am I still passionate about Atlanta sports? You better believe it. You know, I thought if they wanted to do something, they could have said, you know what? We'll take you out of the first chair. But in case there's an emergency or this person goes on vacation, I missed two games in 20 years. Two in 20 years. Do you know how much effect that had on my life, my marriage, my children? Because I was so dedicated to that game and to just be like, and I think one of the quotes was, you know, uh, like the Godfather, they, they said, it's just business. That's not business. That's intentional. You intended to teach me a lesson. And now Ryan has learned another hard lesson. This one is about relationships. Ryan was married 16 years, has three children, and been divorced five years. What will it take to have another Mrs. Ryan Cameron? I dated, I used a dating service. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is a very prestigious, I paid. This isn't like Tinder or Bumble or whatever. And they found me a woman and I dated her for almost a year. And I said, I'm gonna marry this woman. And I flew down to her parents' house. I rented a car and I drove to her mother's house and told her, I wanna marry your daughter. I want her to be my wife. And she said, oh my God, I can't believe this. It's gonna be incredible. But I had two rings, cause I haven't proposed to anybody in 22 years, Monica. So I didn't know, you know, I wanted to be, do something different. I didn't want to just, I want to, you know, have this kind of ring and that kind of ring. And so I said, well, which one should I give her? And she said, I don't know, just let her choose. So I go back and I propose. I get out on one knee and I propose. After 11 and a half months, this is it. I'm out of the game. She says yes. And she wakes up the next day. She says, I can't believe I'm engaged. I say, you are. And then the next day comes and she calls me. She says, we need to talk. And for any guy that's listening in, it's the worst text you can ever receive from a woman. We need to talk. And then I go, talk about what? And she says, we just need to talk. So I get there that night and she talks about the ring and that the ring was not fancy enough. What? It wasn't good enough. It wasn't, it, it did not show how I felt about her. No. And I said, so forget all this about me wanting to marry you and spend the rest of my life with you but it's about the ring? And she said, yeah, I thought about it. It's, it's about the ring. I said, well, you know, and I talked about, I had like intense therapy says, bam, 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 you wanna meet today? Yes, meet tomorrow, yes, yes, I meet, meet, meet. And she said, Ryan, if a person doesn't believe that it's you, they're not choosing you, the ring has nothing to do, do with, it. with it. So we went from the greatest relationship for almost a year to broken up after I proposed. Over a ring? Over a ring. That is her loss. One thing that is not lost on Ryan is his need to give back to the community. There is the 20-year-old Ryan Cameron Foundation that is a little different from most. So I said, if I start a foundation, I'm not gonna have it be based on grade point averages. It's gonna be based on interviews and effort. If you're gonna prepare yourself, if you want this money, if you want this college scholarship, if you want this book stipend, you gotta come back and keep giving back like my grandmother made me give back. It's all about the give back, not about the academics. When we return, why his father-daughter dance is healing, and I'll introduce you to Bert Weiss, who is a hit with women listeners and is probably the envy of every other radio personality in town. We don't try to hide too much, and we try to be as vulnerable and honest as we can be, and Life is messy, and I think people understand that. We just want them to know how to be treated by a guy. So whether it's, you know, opening a door or pulling out a chair or showing them how to uh, be respected as young ladies. <laughs> the father-daughter dance is 24 years old. I started the dance when Ryan Megan, my oldest, was four. 
because I just loved the way that all the daughters dressed up and were like princesses or whatever. But then it's evolved into anybody with a father, be it in their 30s, 40s, whatever, people flying in from other countries to be at the dance. And, and so we can't wait till 2023 to bring it back because I always tell people, it doesn't matter if your, your relationship is great, if you have none, this is strange, if it's broken, that dance mends people's hearts. It, it brings, it's the dad who, who knows, forget what's going on with the, the other you know, parent or whatever, the drama, because we're, we're our daughters, we're the first banker, we're the first confidant, we're the first person that they really, really male, that they really fall in love with. So we have a place in their hearts that is beyond anything else. So we can fix that or mend it or make it right. And then we got some great dessert. It's all good. My next guest also believes